our next speaker is uh, Kerry Ressler. He's the James and Patricia Poitras Chair in Psychiatry and Chief of the Division of Depression and Anxiety Disorders at McLean Hospital at Harvard Medical School. Uh, prior to moving to McLean in 2015, uh, Kerry had spent 18 years at Emory University in Grady Memorial Hospital in Atlanta, where he founded the Grady Trauma Project. Uh, that's a study that's focused on the understanding of the psychology, biology, uh, and trauma-related factors contributing to intergenerational cycles of trauma exposure and PTSD. Uh, substance abuse and violence are part of this as well. Uh, it, it looks at over 13,000 participants from urban Atlanta, and it's been really one of those classic studies uh, that is continuing to give us new insights into the relationship between trauma and PTSD and um, giving us also that view of how substance abuse and violence play into all of those uh, outcomes. Uh, Kerry continues to be very active in the, um, in the Atlanta project. He's a visiting professor at em Emory and through his national leadership roles in understanding the biology and genetics of PTSD, uh, works with several large multi-site consortia. Kerry, it's great to have you here. Um, my goodness, I think I've known you since you were a first year resident at Emory. I can still remember your first day when you came to join us in Atlanta. Uh, and it was pretty obvious uh, from the get go that you were that kind of rare gem, uh, this naturally gifted clinician, uh, brilliant researcher coming out of a Nobel laureate's lab uh, and also a generous colleague. Uh, you were, uh, if I remember this right, I think you were the first person I hired uh, and I think I gave you your first job at the Center for Behavioral Neuroscience. Um, no doubt uh, you were a huge part of the success of that, of that center. And I, I must say, none of us were surprised when you became one of the only psychiatrists to be selected as an investigator for the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, I don't think any of us were surprised when you became one of the youngest psychiatrists to be selected for the National Academy of Medicine. You've had a just extraordinary career. It's been thrilling to watch as you became president of the Society for Biological Psychiatry and now an advisor for several major national programs, including the NIMH's intramural program. But I guess if I had to stop and think about what's most amazing is the way in which your work has been really a spectacular example of what we mean by translation. Uh, it's hard to think of anybody else who has been able to do this in quite the same way, how you've been able to bridge the, uh, these molecular neurobiological um, discoveries in animals with human genetics and epigenetic research on emotion, particularly on fear and anxiety. Um, I, I think your work has already revealed some of the basic mechanisms of fear processing that reveal uh, how emotion is encoded in the brain. Uh, and this is work that can really make a difference for all of us in this year of anxiety and distress, what I've been calling the year of woe. Uh, thanks for joining us for this year's summit. It is just terrific to have you here. Uh, we really look forward to your remarks. Thank you so much, Tom, and to Inscopix and to One Mind for this opportunity to all be together. Um, it's um, a pleasure and always an honor to follow um, Kay Tai and Tom, your words are so um, thoughtful and it's such fun to be able to do something like this with you 20 something years after um, our work started together. I'm gonna pick up where Kay left off in really talking about positive emotions and sociality and talk about the flip side, negative emotions, stress, fear, and threat. Given um, where we are and given COVID, I thought I would start a few minutes um, just kind of where our understanding currently is of COVID and post-traumatic stress and stress and fear, and then do a deep dive into our understanding of fear consolidation. And one of the things I'll leave you with is post-traumatic stress disorder, maybe one of the few that we can really understand about how we can prevent it in the immediate aftermath of trauma. And that may open many clues into other psychiatric disorders that is very exciting today. So first of all, the question that has been really on the minds of many people in mental health is, will there be a wave of stress-related disorders in the post-COVID period? Um, there's been plenty of evidence over the decades that ex exceptional epidemiolo 
epidemic situation, such as the Spanish flu, increased depression and PTSD like symptoms. The World Health Organization estimates that 30 to 50% of the population affected by disasters suffers from psychological distress. And those with PTSD we know are high risk for a number of different components and that healthcare policies really need to be prepared for this. I'm not gonna go into this from an epidemiological perspective, and maybe some of the later speakers will, but it's certainly something that's on many people's mind. One of the things I just wanted to start with was, what do we do as everyday people given the stress of COVID? And there's a lot that we know about preventing um, stress, depression, and PTSD. Much of it is about having controllability or at least perceived controllability. What Know what to do with your sick, know what to do if you can um, to protect yourself. And that's one of the important, really important components for having a consistent national policy and communication because knowledge and preparation is so much about controllability of stress. And then also what can you do what you can for taking care of your emotional health and how important that is. Taking breaks from watching, reading, listening to the news, particularly over these last weeks and months and taking care of your body, meditation, mindfulness, eating healthy, exercising regularly, getting good sleep and avoiding alcohol and drugs, which can be so insidious when you first just start using them for coping, but then they take over. Making time to unwind, finding ways to be social as we've just been talking about, connecting with community and faith-based organizations. But it's important too to know when to seek help. And some of the critical things to look for when more professional help may be needed are anxiety, stress, and sadness are significantly interfering with function, increased alcohol and drug use to cope, thoughts of self-harm and suicide. These are common in these disorders. And we have to pay serious attention to them. Severe sleep disruption, disinterest in eating or other enjoyable activities, significant irritability, and things like OCD with safety and checking behaviors. So I'm going to dive more into the specific disorder of post-traumatic stress disorder as a model for understanding fear and threat. Importantly, PTSD is clinically important. It's one of the highest risks for suicide, substance abuse, and comorbidity across the full range of psychiatric disorders. And trauma is also a risk factor for, late, for later onset schizophrenia and bipolar, early childhood trauma. It occur, general PTSD occurs in 5 to 10% of the population, but we know at-risk populations such as veterans and community samples, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about our Grady inner city population that Tom referred to, but we know that in inner city at-risk populations um, due to ongoing discrimination, poverty, education, and other components of risk, as well as neighborhood violence, that we have rates of PTSD in some of our um, cities that are as high as they are in our veterans populations. And we have to pay attention to this. PTSD involves having experienced or observed, exposed to actual or threatened death with intense fear and helplessness, with re-experiencing avoidance symptoms, negative symptoms, and sympathetic hyperarousal. This is a, a, a classic picture from Joe Ledoux, one of the founders of the field of threat and fear. And one of the take home messages here is that our amygdala that I'll talk a lot about and Kay referred to in some of the social work in the um, work in social isolation as well. The amygdala is the main emotional rapid hub of emotion, both in salient um, approach behaviors like she referred to in terms of social integration and going towards a social um, being, but also um, avoidance behavior in the fight, flight, or, or fear response system. And so what we know now is that all of the sensory systems, in this case, the eyes seeing a stick-like object, send signals to the amygdala within hundreds of milliseconds, much faster than consciousness, which then activates, in the case of fear, a hardwired fight or flight reflex. The other rest of the information, that stick-like figure going through the higher order visual cortex or sensory cortices, higher order association cortices, and prefrontal cortex, take many more hundreds of milliseconds before the conscious brain is aware of what's going on and can really shut down and respond in a cognitive way to what the body is already doing in an emotional way. And this great review from Kay Tai that you just heard a number of years ago, just shows how the amygdala is really conserved across all mammals and even vertebrates to lizards. And so this is really a very old old conserved brain system. But in the modern world, modern humans, our dysregulated, dysregulation of our fear, fight, or flight, or, or, or defensive stress reaction systems actually cause more harm than good. They're the basis of our phobias, our panic responses, and post-traumatic stress disorder. If we dive a little deeper into what's going on, again, we can think of the amygdala as the hub of these emotional responses. And that's being constantly modulated by prefrontal cortical areas and by the hippocampus, which provides context and, and discrimination components. And when those don't work as well, you're not able to put the top-down regulation on the amygdala. 
We know through work of decades of people like Mike Davis and Joe, Joe Ledoux and Mike Fanzalo and others, um, and certainly in recent decades by Kay Ty's group and others, that multiple subregions of the amygdala, and at the end of the talk, I'll talk about cell-specific populations of the amygdala, are involved in pairing the previously neutral information with the trauma response, so that now through neuroplasticity, NMDA plasticity, calcium-dependent um, plasticity that activates a whole set of specific new molecular mechanisms of synaptogenesis, that new synapses are made, new connections are made, so that in the future, a previously neutral stimulus activates the whole fight or flight system. And what we see here on the bottom of this figure is that unlike many of our other um, behaviors, hardwired outputs from the amygdala are known to lead to the underlying intrinsic fear reflex, the increased blood pressure, the GI distress, the respiratory distress, the increased startle response. And so more so than most any other place in our understanding of neuroscience and behavior, there's been decades of work putting all this together. And the same set of symptoms activated by amygdala to subcortical projections is what activates the panic response that underlies the panic response of fear, phobias, and PTSD. I'm gonna to talk today, given the limited time, about some of the great progress that's been made in understanding consolidation. And what consolidation means is that memories go from the initial pairing of the trauma and the contextual events to a short-term memory that is labile and receptor dependent and transient. And over the course of hours to days to weeks, it becomes a long-term memory. And that long-term memory can be modulated through extinction processes, possibly through reconsolidation processes and longer-term memory. One of the most exciting and promising things about PTSD is that we, by understanding what happens in these early events, it leads to the possibility that we could have preventions in the immediate aftermath of trauma in our emergency departments or on our battlefields, just like we do to prevent heart attacks or strokes by having an intervention early in the golden hours after trauma, and that our understanding of neurobiology may lead to this. So I wanna um, give you a few hints of data from some of the human studies and then dive down into the animal studies. Some of the early work in our group and others um, started in emergency departments. And this is expanded to a large scale study called the Aurora study, part of which is um, funded by NIMH in large part, as well as One Mind in the Department of Defense. And the goal of this study is to enroll over 5,000 people in the immediate aftermath of trauma in emergency departments and follow them up to a year with all of the current cutting edge devices we can, wearable devices, um, phone-based active and passive um, apps, um, as well as intermediate um, imaging of brain function and physiology, as well as to identify blood-based biomarkers. And while the data are still relatively early, this large-scale publicly available, to be publicly available data set will really create a whole trajectory of understanding what happens to the human brain and body in the aftermath of trauma, how can we understand it, and how can we intervene? Some of the early data that are quite interesting from the pre-studies and now the Aurora studies are one that sympathetic arousal, activation of the adrenergic hyperarousal system, immediately after trauma may be a strong predictor of later PTSD. This graph on the left shows the, um, that skin conductance in the aftermath of trauma predict, correlates highly with six months PTSD. And again, that this, this skin conductance really just a few hours after the trauma in the emergency department may be predictive. So that if we can intervene with the adrenergic system early on, that may be one critical factor. Also, the neural circuits that we've now long known to be involved in trauma and fear and PTSD are involved very early on. This work from Jenny Stevens um, and colleagues showed that in the aftermath of trauma, about Im neuroimaging of fearful cues about two weeks after a trauma is highly predictive of PTSD symptoms both three months and 12 months later. In contrast, I mentioned that the hippocampus serves to provide discrimination, contextualization, and decrease amygdala activation of fear. And Sana Van Roy showed that high level of hippocampal activation is associated with low PTSD symptoms three months later, but low levels of hippocampal activation to a hippocampal in inhibition probe, again, about two weeks after the trauma, is again predictive of high PTSD symptoms um, three and six months later. Some very recent um, unpublished work by Jenny Stevens and our group with the Aurora data is starting to use machine learning and cluster analysis to say, let's take three different types of neuroimaging-based 
tools that, that probe the brain circuits that we know are involved in emotional responding. Threat-based responding to fearful faces, reward-based responding to unexpected card rewards, and inhibitory responses related to an inhibition task. And when these data are put through with a couple hundred people um, in a longitudinal way to see what um, clusters of brain activity predict PTSD types with the idea that there's an underlying biology that doesn't necessarily rely upon our DSM or other symptoms, and that by understanding that underlying biology, we can better target that biology. She comes up with, with three or four clusters, three of which are quite clear and replicate in multiple cohorts. One of which is, is a generally salient reactive group that activates high levels of a dorsal anterior cingulate and hypothalamus and brainstem regions to threat, but also activates um, salient regions to reward. Another that she calls low reward, but high threat. So this is like an anhedonic group with high amygdala activation to threat and high hippocampal activation to threat, but very little response to reward. And a third that seems to be high reward and particularly resilient. So this kind of work will hopefully start to give us new biological intermediate phenotypes that predict the early aftermath of trauma to better know what we can target and towards whom. At a genetic level, the field of post-traumatic stress has made great strides as well. The Psychiatric Genomic Consortium, which I've been a co-PI with, with Caroline Navergelt and Kirsten Conan and Murray Steen, um, now has over 200,000 total cases and controls and has shown very clearly that post-traumatic stress is as heritable, heritable as depression and almost as heritable as bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, around 40 to 50 percent. Um, furthermore, very recent data and soon within the next year, a number of combined further analyses are starting to show a number of genetic hits that show a real clear genetic architecture of trauma responding in the aftermath of a trauma. And this um, graph on the bottom shows a Manhattan plot showing different genetic loci associated with PTSD from the Million Veterans Program. Very interesting to those of us who've been doing translational work is one of these hits on chromosome 17 is in a cluster of genes that encodes the corticotropin releasing hormone receptor, CRHR1. And while um, a lot is, needs to be done in terms of causality, we know that the top SNPs here are expression-linked quantitative trait loci, suggesting that there's a relationship to causality. And that matters because literally decades of work have shown that the, the amygdala hypothalamic pituitary adrenal CRH ACTH cortisol pathway is one of the most well understood aspects of our of the stress system only one component of the stress system but it's really a window for which we and others have been able to show that CRH in animal models uh, mimics PTSD like symptoms in adults and may lead to new targeted treatment so how do we advance from a bottom-up perspective our work in animal models of stress and fear and threat circuitry to lead to new understandings and interventions for trauma and PTSD? Kay referred to um, the, the central amygdala and the basolateral amygdala. Um, what we're now understanding is there's up to 10 different nuclei within the amygdala. And more importantly, there's tens if not hundreds of different distinct cell types within the broader amygdala that all have different functions. And Kay referred to um, different microcircuits and her work from her lab has shown previously that both appetitive and aversive circuits flow within the basolateral amygdala as her the recent work she just showed in terms of sociality in the central amygdala. New tools for understanding single cell sequencing as well as single cell imaging, such as within Scopix products, um, really lead to a whole new way of understanding this. And I wanna quickly um, walk through just a couple recent data points from our work. I talked about the CRH receptor as one of the top genetic hits that recently has come out of the Million Veterans Program. Well, it turns out the CRH neurons are specifically in the central lateral region of the amygdala. And we recently, led by Ken McCullough, who actually crossed um, over with Tom in California, um, did work showing, uh, looking at the role of the CRH neurons specifically in the central lateral amygdala during both fear learning and extinction learning. And extinction, we think, is the underlying component of exposure therapy. When we did RNA sequencing of the actively transcribed genes specifically in the cells of the amygdala that were the CR8 cells, we found a whole host of genes that were differentially regulated with learning to inhibit fear. And particularly a number of the activity dependent genes um, that were inhibited with inhibiting fear, if you follow that, <laughs> were driven by CREB. And CREB is exciting because that's um, a gene pathway that's really started with um, 
Eric Kandel's work in aplegia, and we now know is really conserved across all species related to neuroplasticity. And it's a master regulator in the CRH neurons that underlies the learning of extinction. And the directionality is CREB pathways are down-regulated during extinction learning and up-regulated during fear consolidation learning. And we just showed um, mechanistically that if you overexpress CREB you, in the bottom here, you get more fear learning and a deficit in extinction learning, validating that finding. How else can we identify new pathways? Well, this is um, work that started a few years ago, but continues um, to advance. We started looking at genes that are differentially regulated in the amygdala in the aftermath of trauma, saying what exactly underlies this memory consolidation process? One very interesting was tachykinin 2 that encodes neurokinin B. We showed that that changed dynamically with fear consolidation, later showed using optogenetics that if we activate the tachykinin 2 cells in the central medial amygdala, that that leads to increased consolidation and increased fear formation. Tachykinin 2 cells are very interesting in their, in their localization within the central medial amygdala, but not the central lateral or basolateral amygdala. They're the, one of the main cell populations that potentially could be the hardwired outputs of the central amygdala to all of those brainstem and subcortical areas mediated the threat reflex. There's also, interestingly, an antagonist that is already um, known to be safe in humans and can be used very rapidly um, in potentially in human trials, and it's called a sanitant. And we showed that if we block the tachykinin pathway, both systemically or specifically within the in amygdala in the aftermath of trauma, so an hour, say an hour after trauma, the, the, and the mice in this case encoded the fear much less. And furthermore, if we did the flip experience where we overexpressed tachykinin 2 in the central amygdala, the animals encoded fear much more. And we could show that that worked in both directions by, by repeating the experiment, overexpressing tachykinin 2 leading to more fear, blocking tachykinin 2 with osanitant drug leading to decreased fear. And when we do both, we get a normalization of fear. And this is one example of several different pathways now that are starting to be understood at a basic cellular level that could lead to new drugs to intervene and block memory or decrease memory consolidation in the immediate aftermath of trauma. Future work using tools like enscopics, and this is a recent paper um, from Grundemann, Schnitzer, and Luthien and colleagues, show that amygdala can look at all the amygdala neurons at the same time during both appetitive and aversive behaviors. Um, and what they found was these ensembles reflect moment-to-moment -moment changes in exploratory behavior, reward-like behavior that Keitai has shown before, versus defensive avoidance behavior, and that the basolateral amygdala circuits may switch back and forth in dynamic ways. If we can find targeted ways to modulate that, through known neurother um, neurotherapeutic targets, we could specifically increase or decrease fear versus appetitive or social emotions in targeted ways. And one specific translational way to do that is the new tools of single cell sequencing, 10X um, and DropSeq and others, in which we and others are now sequencing human amygdala, non-human primate amygdala and mouse amygdala to be able to say, what are the specific cell populations that are conserved across all these species? And more importantly, if we understand the microcircuit effect on behavior, can we target those and thus translate to low-hanging fruit, if you will, for receptor targets in microcircuits that might inhibit fear? So that leads then um, to the work, like I um, mentioned at the beginning, that the ideal would be that neuroscience-driven interventions for PTSD prevention would allow us to take our understanding of the neurobiology, identify a host of new compounds that really intervene with that early consolidation and lead to, in the end, just a normal fear memory as opposed to a black hole of emotion, negative emotion that we see with PTSD. And in my final slide here, um, biomarkers, in summary, biomarkers of trauma response and recovery for novel target discovery are possible. And particularly in trauma-related disorders focusing on consolidation, New data has arisen leading to a whole host of new targets, molecular targets, circuit and cell targets, and systems consolidation targets, perhaps using targeted transcranial magnetic stimulation, early prolonged exposure, and other approaches for modulating plasticity, all of which may lead us to a new way of thinking about how to intervene in the early aftermath of trauma so that the traumatic event is merely a bad memory as opposed to a traumatic, overwhelming emotion that takes over, that a precision medicine approach to neuropsychiatric disorders is possible based on neuroscience progress. So thanks to your attention. Thanks to all the great folks who've, uh, who did the work who I tried to thank as I went along. And thank you, um, Tom and Scopix for having me today.
Well, thanks, Kerry. What what an amazing uh, <laughs> overview of a huge amount of work over a lot of years. And I know uh, it's very difficult to give all the details. We don't have uh, enough time to answer all the questions that'll come up. I can't let you go without just building on the last comment you made. Um, five years from now, we're at a point because of Aurora and other projects where we know who is at highest risk for PTSD after a car accident, after um, a terrorist event, whatever. What will we do for them? What's the intervention for preventing PTSD in someone who's had trauma? What does that look like? Absolutely. So I think there's different ways of thinking about it. I think the current, you know, home run would be in the same way that right now we expect if you have chest pain, you go to the ER based on ECT, based on your cardiac enzymes, they know whether to give you TPA, give you aspirin, give you neurocardiac and cardiac interventions that can prevent heart damage and prevent the heart attack from happening. We need that in mental health. You come, you come in after a car accident, after an assault, after a sexual assault, or on the battlefield, and if based on X, Y, or Z biomarkers or physiological or behavioral responses, combined with self-report, we know that you have a 95 or 99% chance of developing PTSD six months from now, which currently we don't have those things. We're trying to develop them. We don't right now know who's going to have it or not. But if we did, could we give you drug X, Y, or Z or intervention X, Y, or Z some of which I just talked about, that would actually prevent the PTSD from ever developing in the first place. Awesome. Kerry, thank you so much for being part of this summit. You're coming back for the next summit to tell us all the additional things that we figured out in the meantime. But for now, we're going to let you go back to work and uh, get all of that done. 